That good, huh? There we go. That's what I like to hear. Turn with me to uh, Revelation chapter 3. Book of Revelation chapter 3. If anybody needs a Bible, raise your hand. I, I know you don't. It's Wednesday night. I know you all have your Bible, but you never know. Maybe somebody accidentally left home without it. If you need one, raise your hand. Andy will bring you one. Nobody? All good, Andy. Thank you, bro. Hey, I want to read something to you guys before we jump into this. This is an update from Andrea, Andrea and Frankie. Uh, you guys know Andrea and Frankie. You know what's going on with little Raven, that she's having some hearing issues, right? And they've, they've, she's failed six hearing tests. Um, they are sure there is some, some level of hearing loss uh, abnormality and they were going to have to they're decide, they were deciding whether or not they were going to have to put a cochlear implant in or how, what they were going to do if it was just going to be hearing aids what exactly they were going to have to do let me read this update from you from her to you now this is to know Raven's final hearing screening came back as a total pass and her doctors have no explanation how or why we do though <laughs> The power of prayer. Amen. After more than six failed tests pointing at some degree of hearing loss and four months going back and forth, uh, different tests to determine the cause slash issue, there is not a single problem with her range of hearing in either ear. The doctor couldn't explain or give us any answers on why she's suddenly passing or what could have changed, but they told us only to keep an eye on how she continues to respond to sound and watch for ear infections in the future, just in case. And she said, Frankie and I just wanted to thank you guys and the entire church family for all the prayers Raven received. Prayers answered. Praise the Lord. He really works miracles. We love you guys. <laughs> how awesome is that? I mean, incredible, right? It's a, it's a, a, a miracle. You know, it's funny because when... When I found out about that, <clears throat> um, my first response is, like, I'm, I'm really sad. I'm really bummed when I found out that her, that her hearing was, that she had hearing loss, that she was going to have, maybe have to have a, an implant or have to uh, have hearing aids. And my first response isn't necessarily to go, all right, Lord, I know you have this. I know you're in control. Whatever outcome, whatever it is, I know you have this. I, I know it's not taking you by surprise. You're able uh, to heal. You're able to give her perfect hearing. That wasn't necessarily my response in that situation. My response was to be sad. And yet, the Lord still is working miracles. Jesus is still on the throne. He is still powerful. And, and you know, the fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And so... Thank you guys for praying. What, a, what an awesome testimony. What an awesome testimony. And, and, you know, we say it all the time that the Lord can use these things to confound the wise. And He does. He does. He does. And uh, with, with that in mind, the miracle of uh, Him healing Raven's hearing, which is what He did. He healed her hearing. It wasn't that they were wrong, that she didn't have hearing loss. She did. They had confirmed it was sure. They were just trying to figure out what exactly they were going to do about it. So it's not like it was just a fluke. There was over four or six tests, right? Uh, in light of that miracle, also we had a, a, a small team, which we're putting together an evangelism team, an evangelistic team, a, a team that goes out during the week to witness to surrounding people. And uh, t this Tuesday was their first time going out, small team. And they went out and they got to share the gospel around town to certain people. And it, they ended up getting rained on and it got cut short. But in the very short time, I think they maybe spoke to, what, four people or something like that? Maybe four people. Uh, one of them gave their life to the Lord. And so what I was telling the guys, and you guys know how I feel about that, right? You, we've talked about that before. That is the most amazing miracle of all miracles. That's the only thing in creation that resists the power of God is the stubborn heart of man. And so when one person gives their life to the Lord, we should rejoice over that as much as we rejoice over the restored hearing or over uh, restored sight or uh, healing the lame. We should rejoice even more so for a life that is snatched away from the gates of hell, snatched out of, hell, snatched out of darkness and brought into the light. That is cause to rejoice. So the Lord is working. The Lord is doing a work here, right here in Crystal River, Florida. He is on the move. 
He is powerful. He is amazing. He's a great God that we serve. Amen? Amen. I'm excited, guys. The Lord is doing a great work, and we're a part of it. We just get to be a part of what He's doing. What a privilege, right? Let's pray before we get into the Word tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful to be called Your children. Lord, grateful to be Your sons and daughters. Father, we are thankful uh, that it is by Your grace that we can stand here today, redeemed by Your blood. Lord, not by... Our own merit. Thank, thank God. Thank you, Lord. That is not by our own merit. Uh, not by our fervent pursuit of you, Lord. But it is your pursuit of us, Lord, that has snatched us out of hell. Lord, that has caused it to be established in heaven with you. That our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, Lord. And that they won't be blotted out. Lord, thank you that you've established us forever. Thank you that we've started on our eternal life together with you. Thank you, Lord. Would you have your way with us tonight? Would you speak to our heart by your word? Holy Spirit, would you do a work in this place? Lord, encourage us in your word. Encourage us in our faith. Uh, Lord, remind us of who we are tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we're going to be on the sixth letter to the sixth church tonight in the book of Revelation. You guys remember that Jesus is writing these letters. He's writing these letters to seven churches in Asia for a specific reason, right? And he has something to say to each one of these churches, something important to say to each one of these churches that are for us as well. Therefore, his church as a whole, I, you know, it's, it's interesting that it's to seven churches. We've talked about the significance of the number seven, the number seven being the number of completion, the wholeness of the Lord. This, this seven, these seven churches are represented with the church as a whole, the whole church. And so even though these are seven historical churches, literal historical churches in the time of the first century, when this was written, these letters actually went to these specific churches. They are also written to the whole church, which is why he records them in his eternal word. If they were only, if the, if the letter that we were reading tonight was only to the church of Philadelphia, to the literal historical church of Philadelphia in Asia Minor in the first century, it would not be in the canon of scripture, period. It just wouldn't be in there. It wouldn't need to be in there. We wouldn't have to read it. The the reason why it is established in his eternal word is because it is for his whole church. It's for you and for me, not just for the church at Crystal River, not just for the church at Philadelphia, but for you individually tonight, the Lord wants to speak to you. He wants to speak to you through this letter. It is for you. It's for it's for me. It's for us. And so I want I want to remember that as we study these letters, you know, it's funny because I find myself looking forward, like looking forward to chapter 4. Like, man, I can't wait to get to chapter 4. I can't wait to get into this eternal, like in, into the end times study and into the, what's going to happen during the tribulation. I'm so excited to get into that. But I, I you know, I want to remain excited about what the Lord has to say to us tonight, right now, where we are. His, this word is important for us. It's interesting that the first three chapters... Really, chapters 2 and 3 span a period so far of about 2,000 years. And then we have chapters 4 through the end of the book, chapters 4 through 22, uh, that really span 7 years. The, the vast majority of the book is, is focused on a very small period of time in light of the whole history of the earth. It's this, these first few chapters, these first three chapters that really span 2,000 years of church history. They are speaking directly to the church age. And, and even though I believe that the church age is coming to an end soon and very soon, even though I believe that we've got kids escaping. That happens a lot. And most of the time I don't tell you guys. But uh, even though I believe that the church age is coming to an end soon and very soon, that the door of grace is soon going to be closed, I believe that Jesus is coming for his church very soon. Even though I believe that, we are still in the church age right now. So it's important that we study this, right? It's important that we, have, that we hear what the Lord has to say to His church. And so that's my prayer tonight, is that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Not what the Spirit has said, but what the Spirit is saying. He's saying it right now. And so we'll read it, starting in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy... He who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. 
Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so right there, starting in verse 7, we see this is the letter that we're all excited to get to, right? The letter to the church at Philadelphia. Everybody loves these letters. The letter to the church at Philadelphia and Laodicea. They're like two polar opposites, right? You have the letter to the church of an open door, and then you have the letter to the church of a closed door. You have the letter to the church that's on fire for the Lord, or the letter to the church that's lukewarm, and their fire has gone out. I, 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 you know, I love all of these letters. I'm excited about these letters, uh, uh, the letter to the church of Philadelphia and Laodicea, because I believe, even though I, I think that these churches, uh, the letter to the, all seven churches, spans through the age of all of the churches, there is something special about these last two letters that seem to me to be in the time that we are living in right now. I think that the church of Philadelphia and the church of Laodicea, if you're looking at it as an overarching uh, timeline of church history, I believe that these two churches are contemporary. They're at the same time. They're flowing out of the Reformation. You have the church... Uh, after the Reformation comes, that you have the church that's on fire in the last days, the church that is, is not conceding in their faith, not making concessions. They're going forward. They're following Jesus, even in the midst of a world that is dark and dying. They're true to Jesus. And then you have the church, their fire has gone out, they're lukewarm, and they make concession. I believe that those churches are happening right now. I think that we are living in the age of the church of Philadelphia. I believe that. There are people who will say that this has passed. That the Church of Philadelphia isn't around anymore. Well, they haven't been to Calvary Chapel, Crystal River, I can tell you that. <laughs> I believe that. I mean, listen, guys, look at what he says here. Do you know that the Church of Philadelphia, you know what that word means? Brotherly love. Look around. Look around. We are in a church that loves each other. It loves each other. We have a fellowship of believers here that love each other. We share in this phileo love, this love that the Lord has filled us with, that we get to spend time with each other as family. You guys, man, were you guys here for, for 4th of July? What an awesome time where we got to break bread together, watch the kids slide down the slide. We got to be competitive with each other on the volleyball field and on the ping pong table and then still enjoy fellowship together. It's a family. We have love for each other. And not, not love in just like, you know, I just enjoy being around these people, but love, like, I'm going to spend eternity with them, and I can't wait. You know, there are, there are places where you come in your life. There are times where you enter into this place, and it's a place where you come into, and you don't want to leave. And I don't know where that is for you guys. If you have this place where you get there, you spend time there, and you don't want to leave, for me, that's here. That's here. My family is here. The people who I love the most in the world are here. My literal family is here, and my church family is here, and I couldn't ask for anything better. The Lord has given us a gift here in this church. I believe that the Lord has written this letter to us right now for us to hear. Not that we don't have problems. Of course we do. <laughs> Not that there isn't a, bit, a little bit of Laodicea that creeps into our hearts every now and then. But I believe that we are a faithful church, that we love Jesus, that we stay true to his name. Let's look what he says. He says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I think that right now the Lord is establishing his authority over the church in Philadelphia. He's reminding them of who he is. Now what's interesting about this intro into this letter, I've told you guys that to each of these letters uh, so far, the Lord, when He introduces Himself, He introduces Himself as what the church needs, remember? And all these introductions, all these characteristics that He tells of Himself to these churches are found back in chapter 1. Well, not in this letter. 
We don't find these characteristics of himself in chapter 1. He doesn't introduce himself in chapter 1. He's not introduced in chapter 1 in these ways. This is kind of stands apart from that. And he just reminds them of his authority over the church and who he is. Look what he says. These things says he who is holy. I love that. He who is set apart, unblemished, holy. Jesus is reminding the church of who he is. He's not just one of us. He's not just a superman. He's holy, set apart, high above, separate from everything else. There is God, and then there is everything else. There is every other created thing. God is holy, holy, holy. Remember we sang that tonight. He is holy, holy, holy. That means he is so far above every other created thing. Yes, we were created in his image. Yes, we were created to have fellowship with him. But he is not like us. He's not like us. He is God. He is creator. He is Yahweh Jehovah. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is above all things, even enthroned in glory in heaven, even in the heavens, even amongst all of the perfect angels. He is outside of that. He is outside of all creation. We think of the history of time, the history from the day of creation, from the very day where he creates the space-time continuum where it creates time and matter and space and everything. We, that's, that's the only way our minds work when we think God was even before that. How long has God existed? That's the wrong way of thinking. He was enthroned in eternity before there was even time. He is holy. That's Jesus, guys. Jesus introduces himself to the faithful church, to the church in Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, and he reminds them that he is set apart. He is set apart from all things. It's important for us to remember, guys, because we live in a time where people worship lots of created gods. People worship lots of created things. But God, Jesus, is holy. He's above them. It reminds me of Daniel. Uh, in Daniel, you know, Daniel got to be very well known in, in Babylon. Became one of the most powerful men in Babylon, second only to King Nebuchadnezzar. And then you have Belshazzar who comes on the scene, takes over. And Daniel kind of fades off the scene, the political scene. Because Belshazzar hasn't even met Daniel at that point, right? And they're having this party and the hand comes and writes on the wall. You guys know the story and nobody can interpret it. Brings in all the wise guys, right? Nobody can interpret it. And then... The queen mother comes in, the queen comes in and says, hey, there's one in your kingdom, this man Daniel, who in him is the spirit of the holy God. I love that. More often, more than just that one time in, in the book of Daniel, is Daniel referred to as having the spirit of the holy God in him. The holy God. Set apart from the other gods of Babylon. Set apart from the other gods of the Medes and the Persians. This God who Daniel worshipped, this God who Daniel uh, was a part of his kingdom, this God was holy. Their gods weren't holy. Their gods were just like them. You know that. All of the pagan deities of all of the nations, their gods are just like them. Depraved, immoral, just powerful. But in Daniel was the spirit of the holy God, the God that is different, the God that is unblemished, the God that is set apart from all, the, all other gods. And now Jesus, in his letter to the faithful church, in his letter to the church of Philadelphia, says, I am holy. These things says he who is holy, set apart. He who is true. You guys know that about Jesus. We say it often. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through Jesus, but by Jesus. And Jesus introduces himself as the one who is true. Not just what he says is true. He is true. There's a couple words in, in Greek that uh, you can translate as true. And one of them means, uh, like, objectively true, like as opposed to being false. Something is either false or something is either true. Like a true statement is true, right? And then there's a word that means like real. There's a word that when, when it says true, it means like true in the sense of you can believe it. Not just apart from being, not just a brute fact, but that it's real. That's the word that Jesus uses of himself here. He's the one who's real. He's the one who can be counted on. 
He's the one who is tangible. He is holy and set apart, but he's also the one who is real and he is among you. He's tangible and can be experienced. He's holy and set apart. He's holy, 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 so high above all things. And yet he desires to be among us. He desires to be known by us. He can be examined and he comes up being true, real, in our midst even now. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. He has all authority. He is sovereign over all things. That's a direct quote there from Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 22, this quote is given that, that he'll have the key of David. And he's given the throne of David, right? The key of David, all the authority of David. That throne would be established forever. That was a promise given to David by God himself. That the one who was coming would be seated on the throne of David. And would establish this throne forever. And rule and reign from the throne of David as a king for all eternity. That's Jesus. He has the key of David. And he has the authority to open doors. And when he opens them, no one can shut them. And when he shuts a door, no one can open it. I think about when, when Paul, you know, I, I was going into, wanted to go into Asia Minor. When he's going on his missionary journeys, wanted to go into Asia. He eventually goes into Asia. But he's forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go into Asia at this point. I don't know what that looks like, but to me, that's a shut door. He shut the door in that moment, right? And, it, and Paul wasn't able to open. He couldn't force his way into this. It, the Lord shut the door. But he opened the door to Macedonia, right? He gave Paul an open door into Macedonia. Paul sails a straight course to Philippi, gets there quicker than he should have gotten there. The Lord opened the door and he begins to preach the word. Lydia gets saved from Thyatira. The jailer gets saved in a miraculous way. The church there in Philadelphia begins to be planted. And then Paul heads out through the region of Macedonia preaching the kingdom. And he faces obstruction there. He faces all kinds of trials and tribulations. But the Lord had opened the door. And so he does a work. No matter what they did to come against Paul as he's sharing the gospel in the region of Macedonia, they couldn't shut the door because the Lord had opened it. Jesus is the one who has authority because he has the key of David, because he's seated on the throne, because he's enthroned in glory right now, because he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has the authority to open doors. And when he opens them, no one can shut them. Not even Satan. Not even the most powerful force of darkness in the universe. They can't shut the door that Jesus opens. Listen, that's why we're here right now. That's why we're here. The Lord opened a door. And no one could shut it. We've, you know, we, face, we have faced some roadblocks. You guys know that. In your life, you've faced roadblocks, but you're here. You're here because the Lord opened the door. And even the roadblocks, they couldn't shut the door. You might maybe, maybe cause a detour every now and then, but the door remains open. Jesus is the one who has all authority in heaven and earth. All authority over all things. He has the keys of David. He opens doors that no one can shut and shuts them that no one can open. I love that. That's who our God is. He wants to remind the church in Philadelphia and us here tonight that he has all authority over all things. That he is the only sovereign. That's who he is. I know your works. Now you guys know uh, kind of the you guys know the schedule, right? You know exactly how he does this. First he says, I know your works. He tells them some good things. And then he tells them some bad things, right? Nevertheless, I have these things against you. Well, what's interesting is he doesn't have anything against the church in Philadelphia. Nothing. He has nothing but good report for the church in Philadelphia. I love that, man. That's awesome. You can imagine, though, in Philadelphia right now that, they're, that the pastor probably read ahead, right? He's like, oh, man, let me just hear what he has to say about us first. Because I know we're in there. We got the letter. Let's see what he says. Because they're reading through these other churches. And then he just read the church of Sardis. He's like, ah, oh, it's getting worse. Things are getting worse. At first, Ephesus sounds pretty good. They left their first love. Now we get to Sardis. There's nothing good about the church in Sardis. The only thing that's good is there's a remnant there that hasn't defiled their garments. What does he have to say about the church in Philadelphia? The, the congregation sitting there with bated breath as the Lord introduces himself, right? I'm holy. Oh no, we're falling short in holiness. I know it. 
I know we're not set apart enough. I know that that's what the Lord's going to say. Oh, true. Oh, no. What have we believed that's false? Open door. What did we not take? What opportunities has the Lord opened that we haven't taken? A closed door. Oh, man. What, what door did we go over where we shouldn't have gone? He says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Oh, man. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I have set before you an open door. The Lord isn't saying that he's closed the door in Philadelphia. He's closed the door to them. What door has the Lord opened before them that no one can shut? I believe that this door that he's speaking of... and. It's just my opinion, but I think we have good reason to, to know this, that the door that's open to the Philadelphian church is the door of fellowship together with Jesus. He said he's opened a door and no one can shut it. Nothing can happen that can shut this door that I've opened to the church in Philadelphia. And the, church, the, the door that's open to them is fellowship together with me. Nothing that you can do can ruin that. Nothing that the enemy can do could thwart the fellowship that we have with our Lord. He died so that we could live. He paid the price so that we could enter into His presence at any time, that we could come boldly to the throne room of grace, that we could call Him Father and He calls us sons and daughters, that Jesus now isn't ashamed to call us friends, that we're joint heirs together with Jesus to the throne, we're joint heirs to the kingdom of God together with Him, we're joint heirs, co-heirs with Jesus. He says, I've opened a door before you that no one can shut. I love that. No one can shut it, for you have a little strength. And you might read that and think, what? A little strength? That sounds like a rebuke. It's not. It's not a rebuke. It's a commendation. He's saying, you, hey, you have a little strength. That's a good thing. You know, I, 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 you know when, when me and my kids are doing things together outside, I was watching my son, Jackson. He started mowing the lawn now because we have a push mower and we have 10 acres. So Jackson started mowing the lawn now. Uh, but, you know, he's 10 years old, and, and so we have this pull start push mower. And I was watching him the other day, and he has a much harder time pulling that thing to get it started than I do. It's easy for me to get it started. But he has a much harder time, and he pulls it and pulls it and pulls it, and finally it starts. And you know what? Man, he has a little strength. I see a little strength in him. Like, here he's just been a child for so long, and all of a sudden I see him transforming, coming into manhood. I see the Lord starting to do a work and mature him and grow him, and all of a sudden in him, in my son, I see a little strength. He's no longer just a child anymore. He's growing into a young man. There's a little strength in him. That's a good thing. That's something to rejoice over. As a father, when I see that in my son, I can rejoice over that. He's coming into manhood. There's something maturing in him. That's what the Lord is saying to the church in Philadelphia. Look, you have a little strength. Good job, buddy. It's a pat on the back. You're making it. You're really doing it. Here you are in the midst of a pagan world. Here you are in the midst of a world that is dead and dying and dark all around you, that is trying to pull you down into the depths of darkness. But I brought you into the light. And in the midst of this hardship, man, you have a little strength. You have a little strength. And how do you know that they have strength? How does he know it? How can he see it? What, what, is the, what is the fruit of their strength? You have kept my word and have not denied my name. I love that. He says, you have in you a little strength. And maybe in the midst of where they're at right there in Philadelphia... You know, Philadelphia is this city of commerce, it's a city of means, it's a city of many temples, just like all of these cities in, in Asia Minor. It's, you know, getting into the historical things about these cities, it's interesting, but, you know, I don't know. It's not social studies, I don't know, We're not, it's, not, it's not world history. And so, the point is that just like all of these cities in Asia Minor, they're steeped in idolatry, ste steeped in pagan worship. But in the midst of all of that, look what the Lord says to them. He says, you have kept my word. That's really important to me. That really strikes a chord with me. It gets me right in my heart. It says that the church in Philadelphia has kept his word. I love that. The church in Philadelphia is surrounded by idolatry, surrounded by pagan worship, surrounded by people who are lost who are preaching all kinds of falsehood, preaching all kinds of false ideology. 
the church in Philadelphia kept his word. You know, you guys know Calvary Chapel, we have an emphasis on the word of God. And, and so much so that maybe even to a fault where people around us, there are other churches around us who will say, you know, Calvary Chapel, they believe in the Trinity, all right. It's the Father and the Son and the Holy Scriptures. And they, they, they give us trouble about it. Now, we're not, you know, anybody can just get up and read the Bible. Where's the, where's the work of the Holy Spirit in that? All you're doing is just getting up and reading the Bible. Well, listen, the Bible is all we should want to hear. You don't want to hear my opinion. You definitely don't want it. I'm telling you. Listen, my staff has to hear my opinion all the time. Just ask them about it. They know that it's not great, okay? You don't want that. We want the Word of God. We want the Word of God that Jesus esteems even above His own Name. Do you realize that? That Jesus esteems his word even above his name. He says that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will by no means pass away. And the church in Philadelphia had an emphasis on the word of God. The church in Crystal River, the Calvary Chapel Church in Crystal River has an emphasis on the word of God. It is important. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the sword of the spirit. It's the thing that we use to do battle with the enemy. It's what we go out into the world preaching. The word of God. It's important that we know it. You have kept my word. When the world around you wants you to throw it out. When the world around you has, has turned its back on the word of God. That wants nothing to know of the word. It wants nothing to do with the word. If it, you know, we who hold the word of God, we who are orthodox in our faith, orthodox in our beliefs, we who take the word literally are outcasts in society. You realize that, right? I read a ridiculous uh, survey. I hope it's not true. You know how, you know statistics and surveys. They're often wrong. And so I'm praying it's wrong. But I read something the other day about church leaders. Leaders within churches. Leaders within church denominations. And it's staggering. They were asked whether or not they believed that the Bible was the inerrant word of God. And more than half of the Methodist pastors or preachers or whatever you call them in the Methodist uh, denomination said that they don't believe that. 57% of Methodist pastors don't believe that. That this is the inerrant word of God. All of the, all of the main denominations were almost half or more that don't believe this is the inerrant word of God. Leaders, these are pastors, these are teachers of the word. What are you getting up to do on a Sunday if you don't believe this is the word of God? What are you doing? Why, why open it? You know that more than 50% of Presbyterian pastors don't believe that Jesus actually bodily rose from the grave. That seems insane to me. These are reformed pastors that don't believe that Jesus bodily rose from the grave. Listen up. We believe the word. This is our standard of truth. This is the only thing that we know truth by. Pontius Pilate staring into Jesus, is looking at the very word of God himself, looking at truth himself, asks him, what is truth? And walks away as if it couldn't be known. But we know. Thy word is truth. This is it. Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is the word become flesh. Jesus is the word become flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Jesus is the word become flesh, the word who was God. The word who was with God, an intimate relationship with him, face-to-face -face relationship with God and was theos, was God and he became flesh. The word of God is truth. And Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia, I know your works. I know your works that you've kept my word. You have a little strength. And I know that you have strength because you've kept my word. Even, whenever, even when everyone around you wants you not to. Guys, you, we live in a world right now, we live in a culture right now who, is, who hates the truth of God. Now listen, the world has always hated the truth of God. Always. But now, like never before, this hatred is being ramped up. And we see that in the wake of the Roe versus Wade decision being overturned. We see, listen, there was a, a quote, a statement written on Facebook 
by a friend of mine's girlfriend who said this, I hope that the hell you Christians believe in is real and that you all go to it. Which is a ridiculous statement, right? I hope that the hell that you Christians believe in is real and that you all go there. Over the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Over the fact that we want to protect innocent life. They hate the word of God. They hate the truth of God. But the Lord says, I know your works. You have a little strength. You've kept my word. You've kept my word. That's so important to Jesus. It's so important that we, as the church of Christ, we, as the the born-again believers in Jesus, that we keep his word. That we don't go out into the world preaching the word in some antagonistic, argumentative kind of way, but that we don't give way on it. That we don't give ground on the truth. That we hold fast to the truth of God like an anchor. That we hold on to it as the tide of culture pulls against us trying to dilute the word of God. That we hold it, that it's true, that it's inerrant, that it's perfect, and that it brings forth life as the power of the Holy Spirit comes through his word. It brings people to life. Hold fast to the word. You've kept my word and have not denied my name. I love that, how, how, the, how the order of this, right? He says, you have a little strength. You have a little strength. We see it in you. I see the strength in you, that you're strong in me. You haven't denied my word. You've kept my word, and you haven't denied my name. That's what's important in Philadelphia. It's important in Philadelphia that they're strong in the Lord, that they have a little strength in him, that they haven't lost their strength. They're growing in him. They're strong in him. That they're keeping the word of God. They're holding fast. They're holding the word of God in high honor. They're keeping the truth of God's word. They have that as a focus for them as the church. That they're focused on God's word. And that they're not denying the name of Jesus. Do you know that that's important for us too? Are you denying the name of Jesus? Are you afraid to claim the name of Jesus? Listen, there have been times in my life where I've had moments of uh, these opportune moments to speak the name of Jesus. And I haven't. I've kept quiet. I remember I was, I was already a pastor, and it was when I was still down in Palm Harbor, and I was at the gym. And after the gym, I, I liked to go to the sauna, and there was this guy in the sauna. I was sitting next to this guy, and I felt the Lord put on my heart that I should witness to him. I should tell him about Jesus. And I said in my heart, all right, Lord, if you want me to witness to him, have him stand up right now. I, put out, I laid out a fleece for him. All right, Lord, if you want me to witness to this guy, have him stand up right now. And guess what? He stood up, and guess what I said? Nothing. I let him walk right out of there and didn't say a word. In that moment, I was denying Jesus. I was, I was ashamed. I purposed in my heart to never let that happen again. I purposed in my heart in that moment that, Lord, at any opportunity that you give me, I'm going to speak your name. I'm never going to deny your name again. I'm never going to come up weak again like that. Lord, I know that this is your will for me. Not because I'm great at it. Not because I, it comes easy to me. But, Lord, because I want people to know you. I just want to be found faithful. And I won't ask you to do stupid things like that anymore. I won't lay those things out for you like that anymore. I've learned my lesson, Lord. But the church in Philadelphia, the faithful church, they've held true. They have strength. They haven't denied his name. They've kept his word. Verse 9, he says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. This is, this is important, guys, because, uh, you know, in this era, you have... Uh, Jesus is sending into heaven, sending out the disciples. They go preach the kingdom. They go preaching the gospel in all the lands. Paul going out. uh, John being used of the Lord to plant churches and to pastor churches. All these amazing things that are happening. And in the midst of that, you have the Judaizers that are coming in and trying to pervert the gospel. They're saying, yeah, this Jesus thing is great, but also you need to become uh, Jews. You need to become a Jew first before you can worship Jesus. If you want to worship the Messiah, that's fine, but first you have to become a Jew. You have to be circumcised and you have to keep the law of Moses. 
Well, we know Paul writes about that in the book of Galatians. He writes a letter to the Galatians that anybody who becomes circumcised as as a method of trying to become righteous before God, who keeps the law of Moses as a method of trying to become righteous, that they've fallen from grace and Christ's of no effect to them. That they're a debtor now to keep the whole law. But not only are we talking about the Judaizers here, of those who claim to be Jews and are not, they're really a synagogue of Satan. Not only are we talking about just the Judaizers, but the Jews who have denied Jesus as the Messiah and have persecuted the church. And I think that's what the Philadelphian church is facing. I think they're facing persecutors of the church who are saying that they're Jews. And what does Jesus say about them? I will make those of the synagogue of Satan... That those who are claiming to be Jews are really not Jews. They're of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. What does he mean by that? Does he mean that the faithful church is going to be worshipped? That he's going to cause those who claim to be Jews but are liars, they're not really uh, Jews, they're of the synagogue of Satan, they're moving and acting according to the will of Satan. Is he going to have them come and worship us or worship the faithful church? No, he's saying that he, that we, as the faithful church, are going to rule and reign together with Christ, and he's going to vindicate us by having those who have claimed to be Jews and have persecuted the church come and worship before us, and they're going to see that Jesus has loved us. Jesus has loved the faithful church. He says that I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews. And are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. I think that he's speaking of the millennial age, this time where Jesus comes uh, to set up his kingdom on earth, to rule and reign on earth with a rod of iron from Jerusalem. I think that when he returns, everyone will recognize who he is in that moment. And they'll realize how wrong they really were. It's, it, it, it's a difficult verse because we know that the Lord's heart for Israel, uh, the, the way he looks at Israel, still, even now to this day, that they are his chosen people. But we also know from going through the Minor Prophets and where it says in Zechariah that two-thirds of those who claim to be Israel will die. Two-thirds. One out of every three Jews, only, only one out of three are going to make it. That's the remnant. And the rest of them claim to be Jews but are not. They're, they're lying. They claim to be Jews. They have Jewish uh, heritage, but they're not seeking the true and living God. And he's going to vindicate his church. He's going to vindicate the faithful in him uh, to the unbelieving world. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. It says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. This is an important verse because I think as a, a pre-tribulationist, which, which that's what I am, you guys know that, that I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe that the Lord is coming for his church before the wrath of God is being poured out on the world. And interestingly, that these last letters, all of these last letters all have a promise concerning the coming of the Lord. That means that all of these systems, all of these church systems, even the church of Sardis, the church of Laodicea, the church of Philadelphia, the church of Thyatira, they're all alive and working until the coming of the Lord. And so those who have kept his name, those who haven't denied his name, those who have kept his word, those who have a little strength, the Lord says about them that because they have persevered, because they've kept true to the word of God, because they believed and not denied Jesus, they believed in him, walked in belief of him, surrendered themselves to the truth of who Jesus is and have kept his word, those believers will be kept from the hour of trial. Now what is this hour of trial? Well, you guys know because you're students of the word. This is the tribulation. Now, there's trial that comes upon the church, right? There's tribulation that the church has endured since Pentecost, right? The church has endured tribulation throughout all the ages. But there's a definite article here before this word trial. It's the trial. The hour of trial, right? 
It's a specific time period that is given forth by Jesus, saying it's coming upon the whole world, but those who are faithful, those who have kept his name, those who haven't denied him, are going to be kept from that specific time period of trial. And this time period of trial, this hour of trial, is coming upon the whole world. Now, people will say, well, yeah, yeah, that's fine that you know, there are people who are post-trib kind of people that say, well, look, the church is going to be preserved through the hour of trial. That the church is going to be kept from it. Like, in, in the sense of, like, they're going to go through it, but they're going to be kept from the tribulation in some sense. That they're not going to have to go through it. Well, that's a great thought. The problem is, as we get into this, as we get into chapter 4 and moving forward, as we see the seals open, we see people having... Trial, tribulation comes upon the whole earth. It starts to happen. And then uh, this Antichrist is given power over the saints, the, tri- the, the tribulation saints, those who have come to the Lord during the tribulation, and they lose their life. They are killed during the tribulation because of their faith in Jesus, the fact that they won't take the mark. They're killed, they're beheaded. Now, if the Lord is saying here that he's going to keep them through the hour of trial, that he's going to preserve them, then the problem is the Lord isn't true to his word. Either he's not powerful enough or he's lying. But the word here in Greek, kept from the hour of trial, is the word ek, which means out of. It's out of. That I will keep you out of the hour of trial. That I will preserve you from it in the sense of taking you out. Out of it, because the hour of trial is coming upon everybody who dwells on the face of the whole earth. That's what Jesus said in Luke. But you watch and pray that you'll be counted worthy to escape these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Where is the Son of Man right now? Where is Jesus? He's enthroned in glory, and he says the way that you will escape it, he says this hour of trial, this period of darkness, the time of Jacob's trouble is coming upon everybody who dwells on the face of the whole earth, and no one is going to escape it. No one is going to get out of it, but you, in contrast to everyone else, but you watch and pray that you be counted worthy to escape these things and to stand before the Son of Man. The Lord promises us in His letter to the church of Philadelphia, those who stay faithful to His word and true to His name and don't deny Him are going to be kept out of the hour of trial. Man, what a, what a promise. What an amazing testimony of His grace and mercy and His love for his bride, I heard a pastor say this week that husbands are called to love their wives in the same way that Jesus loves his bride, that Jesus loves the church. Well, if you're a post-tribber, if you're, mar- if you're a wife and you're married to a post-tribber, you've got problems. Because if Jesus is going to love you in the same way that he loves his bride and he beats his bride up before the wedding consummation, then you've got a problem. The truth is that Jesus keeps his bride from the hour of trial because you were not appointed unto wrath. All of the wrath that you deserved fell upon Jesus on the cross and he paid it in full, perfect, totelestai. It's finished. Nothing else needs to be done. It's done. It is finished. The wrath that you deserve fell on him and he paid it in full, something that you could never do. And so he says to those who are faithful, I will keep you from the hour of trial. I will keep you from the hour of trial. I love that promise. Which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Now, you guys know this was written in around 94, 95 AD, right? Almost 2,000 years ago. We serve a God who has been coming quickly now for 2,000 years. The word quickly there doesn't mean that it's going to happen soon. It means when it happens, it will be with speed. It will be rapid. It will be quick. It will be instantaneous. He says, when I'm coming, I'm coming quickly. It's happening fast. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Now, I love this because this is a promise to the church in Philadelphia. But uh, before this, he says almost the same thing, that he was coming quickly, but it was judgment upon the church, right? He says, endure, or I'm going to come quickly. And here, to the faithful church, is a promise. Behold, I'm coming quickly. I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. 
over and over again, the Lord is telling those who are overcomers, the Lord is, is telling those who haven't defiled their garments, who are, who are staying true to Him, to hold fast, to hold fast to what they've already been given. This is so important for us to wrap our minds around, guys, because the Lord has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So often we face trials, we face tribulation, we face temptation. We say, Lord, give me strength. Give me what I need right now to get through this. And that's not a bad prayer. It's not bad to pray that. But just, I want you to know that he's already given you what you need. The point is you have to believe that. The point is you have to really walk in belief of the reality that he has given you everything you need to live a victorious, Christ-filled, Holy Spirit-led life. You have everything you need for life and godliness. And what he tells us to do is hold fast to it. Lean into it. Hold fast. Set your feet. Don't let it slip. Hold fast to what's been given you. Hold fast. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He implies there that you have reward. You have reward. Hold fast to it. Hold fast to it. Don't let anybody cheat you out of what the Lord has given you. Hold fast. What you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall no more go out. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who overcomes. You know what it says about us that we are victorious in him, right? In fact, it says that we are more than conquerors in Christ. So you have to read this. You know, when you approach something that is difficult to understand, you have to approach it and read it in the context of what you already know about God's Word. What do you already know? What do you already know about who you are in Him? What do you already know about what He's done for you? What He calls you? What He says about you? What I know for sure, what I know for sure is that I have an inheritance laid up for me in heaven. What I know for sure is that that inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled. It fadeth not away. It's reserved for me in heaven. And if it's a reserved for me in heaven by Jesus, that means it can't go anywhere. No one else can take it. It's reserved for me in heaven, and I am kept to it by the power of God through faith. That it's sure. It is a sure thing. That I'm a joint heir together with Jesus. I know that for sure. I know for sure that Jesus calls me son. I know for sure that I've been washed in the blood of Christ. I know for sure that he loves me. I know those things for sure. So when I come to a, to a verse like, like verse 12 where it says, He who overcomes, I don't waver and think, man, I sure hope I overcome. I know that He calls me an overcomer. I know that He says that I am more than a conqueror in Him. So I know I will overcome. Because He does it for me. Not because I'm great. Not because I'm tough. Not because I'm strong. Not because my grip is so strong on Him. But because He's holding me. And there is nothing, 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 no created thing that can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. Nothing. So do I have to worry about overcoming? Do I have to worry that I'm going to make it? No. He already calls me son. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. You know what a pillar does? It holds things up. That's one of its jobs, right? That's not the sense that he's using here in the temple. We're not holding up the temple of God in eternity. But you know what a pillar does really well? It stays still. It doesn't move. Pillars are immovable. Pillars are steadfast. Pillars are unshakable. Pillars are not easily moved from their position. He says, I'll make you a pillar, a permanent structure in the temple of my God, and you will no longer go out. You know, you think about coming in and out of the presence of God, and, you know, when you, when you are in His presence, and, and you have that overwhelming, just tangible experience of being in the glorious presence, presence of the Lord and it's overwhelming and then we end up getting in the way of that not that we don't have access all the time but we are prone to wander and we find ourselves in the wilderness again wandering outside of his presence and we get this this desert dry feeling of like Lord I just want to be back in your presence can you imagine what it will be like when there will be no more hindrance no more no more fleshy nature no more sin nature that 
It causes you to wander in your heart and, and find your way out of the presence of God. But soon and very soon we will be made as a pillar in the temple, never to go out again from his presence. He promises the Thessalonian church that at his coming, when he descends from heaven with the voice of, our, with the, with the voice of an archangel, with a trumpet, with a shout, and the trumpet of God, that at that moment, we who are alive and remain will be transformed, will be together with him. And it says, and thus you shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You will always be with Jesus forever. You will never be outside of his presence. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, a permanent structure in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He claims you. You're his. He'll write his name on you. Not only that, he'll write... Where your residence is, the new Jerusalem, heaven, he's going to write that on you so that if you get lost, if you get turned around, someone will know where to send you. You belong back there in the new Jerusalem. That's where you belong. That's your residence. That's your permanent place. That's where you stay forever in the presence of your God continually for all eternity. That is the promise. Your name, his name, will be written on you. Thank you, Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for these truths. Lord, we thank you for these promises. Lord, that you've rescued us. Lord, we pray that we would just remain faithful, remain steadfast. Lord, let us stay true to your word. Let us look to that, the scripture, the inerrant word of God, as a beacon, as a light that shines in the darkness. The prophetic word confirmed, which we do well to heed as a light that shines in the darkness. Till the day dawn, the morning star rises in our hearts, Lord. Let us be fixated on the word of God. Lord, help us. Give us that strength to not deny your name. Let us speak the name of Jesus with authority. Not just speak it in a whisper, Lord, but proclaim it as a herald to a lost and dying world who needs it who needs to hear it. Father, let us be your heralds. Let us be your spokesmen, Lord. Let us be your ambassadors. Let us preach your name to a world who desperately needs salvation. Lord, let us hold fast to that which we've been given, to that which we have. Lord, we thank you for the open door that no one can shut. Lord, let us step through it into your presence, into fellowship with you, and never leave. Father, we pray that you would come quickly. Jesus, would you come quickly for your church? We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Quick announcement. Uh, On Sunday, after church, we have a quick VBS rundown, run through, for all volunteers. If you're a volunteer in any capacity for VBS, stay after the church on Sunday. It'll be very quick. We'll get through it quick. And you'll be on your way, but stay after church on Sunday. And anyone bringing fruit and decor, bring it on Sunday, okay? All right. Listen, you guys read ahead. Read the Church of Laodicea. I'm excited about it. I'm excited to read it. It's a heavy letter. It's a heavy rebuke. Uh, But we need to hear that as well. Just as much as we need to hear what the Lord says to the faithful church, we need to hear what the Lord says to the lukewarm church. So read ahead, okay? Uh, I'll see you guys on Sunday. I love you. Praise the Lord.